The first aphorism further states, Light there was not, for the flame of spirit was not yet rekindled. This is apt to prove a hard saying to those who, having the half-truth only, and not realizing the existence of the other half, have thought of infinite reality as being spirit, of which the flame is, of course, the occult and esoteric symbol. But the best ancient wisdom, as voiced by the most careful teachers, have ever taught those qualified to know the whole truth that not only back of matter, but also back of spirit, there abides an eternal and infinite essence, which is neither spirit nor matter, but which is the unconditioned root and source of both spirit and matter, light and flame. The two universally recognized esoteric and occult symbols of spirit have back of them the lightless and heatless essence of light and heat. The infinite reality is the essence of the spirit light and flame, not the light and flame itself. The student will be aided in grasping this truth if he will contemplate the flame of a lamp, a candle, a gas flame, or any other kind of physical flame. He will perceive to be present under and at the center of the flame a dark, transparent something which is the essence from which the flame itself proceeds and upon which it draws for support and sustenance. In occult terminology, the counterpart of this on the higher planes of being is called the dark flame. It is the essence of the flame and light, and not flame or light itself. As an ancient writer has said, the essence is the spirit of the fire, and not fire itself. Therefore, the attributes of fire, i.e. heat, flame, and light, are not the attributes of the essence, but rather of the fire of which the essence is the cause. Therefore, the infinite unmanifest, the sleeping eternal parent, must not be thought of by the student as being spirit, in the sense of the latter term as commonly employed in our thought. Rather, it is akin to pure space from which the flame emerges and in which it is contained. There is close reasoning and distinction here, which will become clear to the student as he proceeds, but which must be noted even now in passing. The first aphorism further states, Time there was not, for change had not begun. Here again is expressed another hard saying for the student who has not grasped the true meaning of time. Time, in the strict philosophical meaning of the term, does not mean pure duration of existence. Instead, it means the measure of changing existence. An enduring existence in which there is no change of form, activity, or degree, mental or physical, is timeless. Time, in fact, is but the measure of change. Without change, there can be no time, in the true sense of the latter term. Pure being manifests not time. Time is the result of becoming or change, and is always measured by change or becoming in something. The following statement from a modern textbook may serve to point to the difference between the conception of pure duration and time pure duration. Pure duration is conceived without regard to the motions of changes in things. Time, on the contrary, is the sensible measure of any portion of duration, often marked by particular phenomena, as the apparent revolution of the celestial bodies, the rotation of the earth on its axis, etc. Our conception of time originates in that of motions and particularly in those regular and equable motions carried on in the heavens, the parts of which, from their perfect similarity to each other, are correct measures of the continuous and successive quality called time, with which they are conceived to coexist. Time, therefore, may be defined as the perceived number of successive movements, Time, based upon the movement of the celestial bodies or the earth, is frequently measured by instruments 
based upon such movements, such as watches, clocks, sundials, etc. We are also conscious of the passage of time by ch changes in our mental states, our thoughts and our mental images, etc., both in the waking state or the state of dreams. Without changes in the outside world, represented to our consciousness by perceptions of such changes, or without changes in our mental states, time would not exist for us. It thus follows that given an eternal, changeless reality, for whom and by whom no outside world has been or is manifested, and which is wrapped in an unconscious and dreamless sleep, such as is pictured in the first aphorism. For such a reality there could exist no time. No time would present itself. Timelessness would abide until change began once more. Therefore the student will perceive the necessary truth of the statement of the first aphorism, that for the eternal parent wrapped in the sleep of the cosmic night, time there was not or change had not begun. It is impossible to hold otherwise considering the nature of time and the absence of change during the cosmic night of the eternal parent. The student will perceive that given infinite existence and the absence of change, then we must necessarily postulate pure duration and the absence of time. There is no logical escape from this conclusion. The first aphorism further states things were not, for form had not represented itself. Here again, we are presented with an unescapable conviction. A thing is whatever exists or is conceived to exist as a separate entity and as a separate or distinguishable object of thought. Everything must manifest form. Form is, number one, the shape or structure of anything as distinguished from the material of which it is composed, hence the configuration of or figure of anything. Two, the mode of acting or manifesting of anything to the senses or to the intellect. Number three, the assemblage of qualities constituting a conception or the internal constitution making an existing thing what it is. Strictly speaking, a thing must be capable of being thought of or pictured as composed of qualities, attributes, or properties, distinguishing it from other things. Hence, everything must manifest form in order to be so distinguished and perceived by the senses or by the intellect of a thing, as a thing. The eternal parent, the infinite unmanifest, cannot be held to manifest form are to display or present any particular quality, property, or attribute of manifestation. When in its state of unmanifestation, when the eternal parent takes upon itself the robes of manifestation, it proceeds to manifest the appearance of things. These things each display in form, and certain qualities, properties, or attributes which distinguish them from other manifested things. It is axiomatic in metaphysics and philosophy that the unmanifest cannot be thought of as possessing or manifesting in its essential nature any one set of qualities, properties, or attributes which appear later in its manifestation of things as distinguished from the opposite of qualities, properties, or attributes. And it can it cannot be thought of as possessing in its essential nature of both, the op of both of the opposing sets of qualities, attributes, or properties. For opposites cancel each other, and antinomies condition not. I never heard that word. Antinomies. I have to look that up. Instead of possessing qualities, properties, or attributes, or form, in any of the meaning of that term, the unmanifest must be regarded as possessing the possibility of infinite manifestation of forms, qualities, properties, and attributes in its manifestations, or the infinite possibility of the manifestations of form, quality, properties, or attributes in its manifested things. 
The infinite unmanifest cannot be thought of as a thing, either in itself or by means of its symbol of infinite space. Rather, as an illumined occult master has expressed it, it must be regarded as an omnipresent, eternal, boundless, and immutable principle regarding which all speculation is impossible, since it transcends the power of human conception and could only be dwarfed by any human expression or similitude. It is beyond the range and reach of thought. It is unthinkable and unspeakable. In the period of the cosmic night, there being nothing present except the infinite unmanifest, therefore, it is seen that necessarily things there were not, for form had not represented itself. There is no logical escape from this conclusion. The first aphorism further states, Action there was not, for there were no things to act. This statement requires little or no explanation. There being no things present, there were no things to act. And all action of the infinite must be through, by, or in things. All actions require change. And where there is no change, there can be no action. And yet it must not be thought that the infinite unmanifest is powerless, for it possesses all power. It must not be thought that it is motionless, for it in itself is abstract motion. Speaking in finite terms, it may be said that in the state of the infinite unmanifest, the eternal parent dwells in a state of such infinite motion that as compared with relative motion, it is a state of absolute rest. The first aphorism further states, the pairs of opposites there were not, for there were no things to manifest polarity. As every student of philosophy knows, or should know, everything manifests a combination of qualities, properties, or attributes. Each quality, property, or attribute is one of a pair of opposites, one pole of the two poles of qualities which are ever found present. Given one quality, property, or attribute of thingness, it necessary, necessarily follows that there is in existence in other things an opposite or other pole, its antithesis. There is no exception to this rule, and though the opposite may at first appear to be absent, diligent search will surely reveal it, and its necessary existence must be logically predicated. Predicated. Thus we have the following similar opposites, hard and soft, hot and cold, large and small, far and near, up and down, day and night, light and darkness, long and short, even where our language fails to supply a definite term for the opposite of a discovered quality, property, or attribute, the opposite may be expressed by prefixing the term not to the observed quality, property, or attribute. Some thinkers have sought to imply that the term infinite implies a quality, property, or attribute which was the opposite of finite, but this is merely a play upon words. The word infinite implies simply an absence of limitations, bounds, or form, and does not indicate any limit, bound, or form, no matter how extended. It is impossible to form a mental image of the infinite unmanifest or to attach thingness or form or quality, property or attribute to any kind of it. Hence the term infinity is not a true opposite. It is only when manifestation begins that the pairs of opposites or polarity put in an appearance. The infinite unmanifest possesses the possibility of an infinity of manifestations, all objects of which manifestation must exist exhibit one or the other of any given set of qualities, properties, or attributes, but to the, un, but to the infinite unmanifest itself, the eternal parent, in its essence there can be no polarity or presence of any one set of pairs of opposites. Here, as elsewhere, the student is directed to think of the infinite unmanifest by means of its simple of infinite space, wherever he wishes to test 
whenever he wishes to test any of the statements of the first aphorism. The first aphorism finally states, The eternal parent, causeless, indivisible, changeless, infinite, rested in unconscious, dreamless sleep. Other than the eternal parent, there was not, neither real or apparent. That the eternal parent is causeless is a self-evident fact, for there is nothing which could have caused the eternal and original being from which all manifestation proceeds. That which is eternal must of necessity be causeless. That which is infinite can have no other which could have caused it, and it would not have been caused from or by nothing, for from nothing nothing comes. That the eternal parent is indivisible is likewise self-evident, for anything that can be divided or separated into parts or particles must, in the first place, be originally composed of parts or particles. And anything that is composed of parts or particles must be merely a composition, an aggregate, a collection, or crowd of such parts and particles and therefore not a real entity or unity at all. Moreover, that which is infinite cannot become divided or separated into parts or particles without losing its essential infinity. A divided infinite is no infinite at all, but merely a collection or crowd of finite things. Absolute indivisibility must be predicated of true unity and infinite being. There is no logical escape from this conclusion. That the eternal parent is incapable of essential change is likewise self-evident. For though it may manifest an infinity of change, nevertheless, it must always remain essentially itself and never anything else but itself. Moreover, not being composed essentially of qualities, properties, or attributes, it cannot undergo the change which comes from the shifting of the poles of the opposites. And not having form, it cannot experience the change which arises from change of form. Absolute immutability must be predicated of the eternal parent. There is no logical escape from this conclusion. That the eternal parent is infinite is likewise self-evident. It must be infinite for there is nothing else by which it may be limited, defined, bounded, caused, influenced, or affected. That which is absolute and original, ultimate and elementary, can have no binding or limiting conditions or things. Absolute infin infiniteness must be predicated of the eternal parent. There is no logical escape from this conclusion. That the eternal parent rested in unconscious, dreamless sleep is held by all advanced metaphysicians and philosophers to be a logical necessity if we are to postulate the existence of a period or state of unmanifestation. For as all psychologists and philosophers know, consciousness, even in the form of dreams, is impossible without change. A changeless state of consciousness can only be expressed as unconsciousness, and yet the student must not fall into the error of believing that this infinite unconsciousness implies inferiority to consciousness. For rather does it imply a state of rising above ordinary consciousness, a state of infinite superconsciousness a state of transcending consciousness in which there is ever present the possibility of consciousness without the exercise thereof. Ordinary consciousness is a descent from this state of unconsciousness, not an ascent. This distinction is important and must not be lost sight of by the student. As we shall presently discover, when manifestation begins to dawn into appearance, then and then only, the eternal parent may be said to begin to dream, to dream of an infinity of universes succeeding each other in rhythmic sequence. And only when the eternal parent shall awaken fully from the dream 
into the bright noontide of infinite self-consciousness, may it be thought of as being fully awake and conscious. These facts will unfold themselves as we proceed with the consideration of the aphorisms. Other than the eternal parent, there was not either real or apparent. Here again, we have a self-evident truth. There can have been no other real being, no other to the infinite and absolute reality. For the predicate of infinity and absoluteness carries with it the implicit predicate of aloneness, oneness, and uniqueness. There can be no other real being to infinite reality. And in the absence of manifestation, there can have been no apparent manifested or created thing or things thing in existence in the period of the infinite unmanifestation. There is no logical escape from this conclusion. Finally, the student is once more bidden to fall back upon the symbol of infinite space in this consideration of the infinite unmanifest. When he finds it difficult or almost impossible to conceive the truth to conceive of the truth of the statements contained in the first aphorism as concerned with the eternal parent in the state of the infinite unmanifest or in the cosmic night. The symbol will be found perfectly adequate in order to, to permit one to think of the infinite unmanifest, although, of course, it is impossible to paint a mental picture of either symbol or the reality which it represents. Edgar Allan Poe had well said of the thought and concept of the infinite and similar efforts of the human mind to think of the unthinkable. This merest of words and some, some other expressions of which the equivalents exist in nearly all language is by no means the expression of, of an ideal, but of an effort of one. It stands for the possible attempt at an impossible conception. Man needed a term by which to point out the direction of this effort, the cloud behind which lay forever invisible the object of this intent. A word in fine was demanded by means of which one human being might put himself in relation at once with another human being and with a certain tendency of the human intellect. And I must continue on in the next 